Greetings, friends. My name is Jonathan. I'm the youth director here at Cornerstone Church, and it's an honor to be able to host today's Sunday service. I'm excited for what the Lord has in store for us. But before we hop into service, I have a few announcements that I would like to share. The first is, if you're new here, you want some more information about Cornerstone, you can actually just take out your cell phone and go ahead and text, say hi to 97000, and a member of our team will reach out to you, get you plugged in, get you any information you may need. Also, it's an honor to be able to share about our outreach this month with Children of Grace, which is an organization, a ministry that is trying to provide hope, education, mentorship, uh, empowerment, uh, to orphans and vulnerable children in Uganda. And we would love for you to uh, consider sponsoring a child. It's beautiful just to think that, you know what, Lord, we have the power and the ability to help out uh, just people throughout the world. And this month, Children of Grace is the outreach that we're looking at. So if you're interested in helping out, if you're interested in sponsoring a child, I encourage you to go ahead and check out our outreach program, our outreach page. With that being said, I'm excited for what the Lord has in store for us. I'm excited for worship. So let's prepare our hearts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our online service. One, two, three. We're reaching out to welcome you, God. Fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe. Give us a great a glimpse of a never changing God. Let's sing to all. Our 
as God, we remind ourselves here that our freedom, our hope, all we're looking for is found in you. Lord, and that at all times in this moment now, whether we're uh, watching this at home or catching up in the car or, or on our way, wherever we are when we're watching this, you're inviting us to meet you here again, to be reminded of your goodness, of your love, of your freedom, of the restoration that you bring, Jesus, to those who choose your way. Lord, and so we center ourselves here in you. And with wherever we're at in our journey, we meet you here. We choose you here. Can't go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know is the place where you promise to be i'm not enough unless you come will you meet me here again because all i
Jesus, you come. Will you meet me here again? Are we one? Cause all I want is all you Thank you, our God, who meets us, Lord, that when we cry out to you, we don't cry into a void, we don't cry to ourselves, we don't cry to our circumstances or the world around us, the things we can see and taste and feel, but when we cry out, we cry out to you, the living God, who never fails. In our weakness, you show yourself to be strong, God, and we invite you in. We thank you for this time, this service, that we get to meet with you and meet with others together, uh, even, even virtually in this new time that we're in, God. And we just ask for your presence over it. Would you speak to our hearts? You've never left us for a moment, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes on you. And we do so here as we uh, receive this message together with intention, with our attention on you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Hey, if we haven't had the chance yet to meet, my name is Odalis. I'm part of the pastoral team here at Cornerstone SF. I was just thinking back to last Sunday. For those of us who were able to gather in person, we had Celebration Sunday. And it was a beautiful time where we got to just give thanks to God for our community, for his faithfulness, and celebrate that community together. It was really wonderful. And the message that Pastor Terry shared with us is a word for our season as a church. And so if you didn't get a chance to listen to last week's message, I want to encourage you to do so. Take a half hour, just get still, spend some extra time with the Lord, and listen for how God is inviting you deeper into this body of faith in this season. You can watch it on YouTube and on our website. As we're moving forward in the fall, pursuing faith as a community, all of our small groups are getting ready to open. Some of them have started already. And I was just thinking, as Pastor Terry had shared from the book of Acts, talking about the early church, there's another verse that reminds me of this as well, uh, from uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They, the, the early believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And reading this, I always think of the different aspects of the life of the church, the apostles teaching like Sunday service, listening to the pastor who's teaching, to fellowship, that's small groups, where we get to grow together with others, build friendships, grow deeper in the Lord together, and really foster a sense of belonging as we pursue God together. So if you're not in a small group, I want to encourage you as strongly and humbly as I can to jump into one. Check out our groups page to see all of the groups that are open. There are some for young adults, for midlife, men men's groups, women's groups, career groups. If you're not finding a fit that feels right, let us know. We want to help you get into a place where you find your fit. Additionally, for our day-to-day -day pursuit of the Lord, don't forget, every day, Monday to Saturday, Pastor Terry puts out a new episode of Rise and Shine, which you can catch uh, on our app as well as actually on YouTube. We really think about it like a spiritual multivitamin a quick one to two minute devotional from pastor. And it's usually an extension of our Sunday message. For all the other ways to plug into community in our church, sign up for our e-newsletter where we send out information about upcoming events and different things that are going on. That all being said, we're gonna shift gears now to receive the message. We're continuing our series called Way of Blessing. But before we do, I would love for us to pray. If you're comfortable, open-handed posture to just indicate an openness to the Lord, but only as you're comfortable. But let's pray and invite the Lord in. 
Father God, we turn to you here in gratitude for this time we have to share, for this community that is local and is extended online, and God, for what you're doing in and through all of us. God, we pray for open hearts and open minds and attentiveness to hear your word here in this time. We ask for you to help us to hear you and help us to respond to you. God, we want to say yes to what it is you're inviting us into, the ways you're healing and growing us and making us look more like Christ. We commit this time to you and we welcome you into it, Jesus. We pray these things in your good and beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Let's receive the message now together. All right, what a blessing to be able to share this moment together with all of you, my friends, near and far, our church community, connected together still, knowing that these are really unusual times, we still seek the Lord so that he might show us the way, the way of blessing. And I'm going to talk about um, how we can, how we can negotiate some, some of life's difficult patches, how we can find God's goodness, even when life is hard. Yeah. You know, it's been a difficult year. Can't, can't deny it. We're on this journey that we've been making. And for a lot of us, it's been rough. It's been a rough, I mean, I'll tell you for me personally, it's been one of the most, you know, as a pastor and a leader, uh, and then just with some things that I'm having to work with, it's been a, it's been a really hard year. And I think what's made it so difficult and I, I think you're all aware of this is just the starts and the stops and the setbacks and the disappointments and then the hopes and then the frustrations and, uh, you know, just the limitations and loss. I think those are two things that really stand out to me that this has been a season of incredible loss for many people. And also a time when we're being faced with not just calamities at a national level and an international level, but in, in things, maybe even inside of our ourselves, but just with limitation. And it, that's been, been hard it really has. And, and I also want to just acknowledge at least that on top of all those difficult things, this has been a time of incredible grace as well, where God's goodness has been evident in ways that many of us could not have anticipated. I mean, to follow Jesus is to live in grace, isn't it? And the Bible reminds us, and you know, this verse Romans eight twenty eight, that we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. And those are two things that are mentioned there as qualifiers, right? Love and alignment, those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. When we, when we, uh, make sure that that love for the Lord is alive and, and something that is inside of us, that's real and authentic, not perfect, but sincere and honest. When that love is there and when we are seeking to bring our lives into a place of obedience and, and, you know, again, I use the word alignment because I think it's the best thing that I, or that I can use to describe it when we're trying to honor what he has taught us inevitably goodness is going to flow and God's going to work good in some way. And, and I also am aware that a lot, some of us, at least we may actually be doing pretty well. And I don't want to just assume that everybody isn't doing well. In fact, some of you have told me that you are actually, you're not, you're doing okay. In fact, you're even more than okay. And I, I would say that that is, is a good thing. Like I, I want us to be good. I want us to be happy. I want us to be joyful. I do. I know that's the Lord's will for us. And, and yet, even if we ourselves haven't been struggling as much in this time, because there might be some aspects of what's been going on that have, I don't know, just more, been more suitable for who we are in our overall disposition. 
and maybe there's been a lot of other provisions that have balanced out some of the things that we've, we've been losing. And so we, we've adjusted, we're, we're okay, but we may be connected to people who are not okay. Like there may be people who we care very deeply about who are struggling. They may be friends, family members, people we're very close to and their struggle affects us. Their hurt affects us. Their loss is our loss. And that's true in the body of Christ. And that's true just in the circles of our relationships. So the principles that we're exploring here are not just meant for uh, us because we might be saying, well, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. So, you know, my life isn't as hard right now, but yeah, but it may be that it is. And if it isn't, it may be that we're connected to people who are having a hard time. So it just makes everything that we're about to discuss exceptionally relevant. And if nothing else, it's a, it's a tool for us to use, to help and bless others. But you know, my prayer is that this word that we're about this, you know, about to share together would be a healing balm in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. I do pray for that in your name. But what I want to do is have us go back, reconnect to the Genesis account. Remember, uh, we're going to learn from it because Jacob is at a point where he's on the precipice of leaving the land of promise. He's an older man. Now he's accepted the invitation of his son, Joseph, who's risen to prominence in Egypt. And it's been a time of famine and economic downturn, downturn, unlike any other. And so, uh, Jacob is leading his family to relocate in Egypt. And yet there's a part of him that is, is concerned that he's stepping outside of the Lord's will. And so he double checks that. And we talked about all those things, the principle of double checking. And so I just want to jump in here and, uh, learn from the, the wealth of God's word that was given is given to us for life. Genesis 46, verse one. So Israel, that's Jacob took his journey with all that he had. And he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt for there. I will make you into a great nation. See, God's giving him a word of assurance. I myself will go down with you to Egypt. And I will also bring you up again in a different way though. (laughs) And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. And then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan. They had prospered in the nomadic life that they had lived under the promise of God. And they came into Egypt and Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons, and his son's sons with him, his daughters and his son's daughters and all his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. Now, (laughs) what follows in, in the scriptures, if you were to read Genesis 46 and verses eight through 27, I mean, what, what follows is essentially what amounts to, I guess there's no other way, really way to describe it is a passenger's list. And the Bible is very concerned that we have all the details, particularly as it relates to, uh, genealogies. It wants us to know that it's rooted in, in real history, connected to real people. These are not just fanciful names or inventions of human imagination that, that we have a connection to something that really happened. And there's a lineage and a way of, of looking and understanding that God's word is embedded into something that occurred in time and space. So it's trustworthy in that regard. But one of the things, like I mentioned, (laughs) honestly, most of the time, those verses are, you know, things that we just skim over. And I was actually going to do that, but there was something that caught my attention. And it's something that I would like to look at have us look at together in verse 12. It's a small detail. It's, it's written almost in passing, but it actually was quite suggestive about something that happened to Joseph's brother, Judah, who was the fourth son of Jacob and the one whose name, and I love this name, it means praise. Yeah. And the one from whom would come 
David who, who gave us songs of praise and Solomon who gave us words of wisdom. And then of course, from the Lion of Judah would come the great savior and redeemer, Jesus, our Lord and our savior. It's all connected. But we read in verse 12, and this is what I would want us to just look at. We read in verse 12 that the sons of Judah, and there's five names mentioned here, Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But then we're told, just like in a parenthesis there, but Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And so we see that Judah's two oldest sons died. How they died is a, a fascinating and colored story discussed in greater detail in Genesis 38. And that's and the way I just described that is an understatement. If you actually read it, it was an unusual thing that happened. Suffice to say though, that Judah and his wife, I'll just call her Mrs. Judah <laughs> at some point between the time when Joseph was sold into slavery and the coming of the famine somewhere in the bracket of that space, they had lost their two oldest sons. They had outlived their sons. They had outlived the ones that they had brought into this world and uh, Aaron Onan and the tragedy and loss that had visited the family of Judah is something that we can only assume that even though those were harsher times where death was more of a reality. And that's why you'll note that in the older Testament and in the newer Testament, uh, death in childbearing, is, was for example, a, a real thing that happened all the time. And so people would either live a long life or they would live a very short life typically. And, you know, I, I was having this discussion with my oldest daughter and some of, you know, her Chloe, she's part of our worship team. And, and for a lot of the, um, season of that we've just had during the, the COVID and the pandemic time with our online service, she's, she's been the one that's been closing out the services. Now she's taken a break because she just had a baby. And one of the things that we were discussing was how the, the, the doctors mentioned to her that, uh, in light of the way that the baby, our granddaughter was positioned inside of Chloe, that in another era, she probably would have died. And, you know, that was just a sobering reminder of how, you know, um, much we take for granted, you know? And I think in that, in this period, in the book of Genesis, things like death, having a child were, were real things. And, and it was not uncommon. And yet still, uh, to lose your two oldest sons, Aaron Onan must've been something that affected deeply Judah. And it got me actually thinking about, you know, and, and of course the whole family and, and Mrs. Judah as well, as I call her, um, but I remember when our young family, my family, Cheryl's and my family, um, dodged a bullet. That's the only way I can describe it. It was about 30 years ago. I was just actually starting as a pastor and, uh, it had been two years. I was, uh, 27 years old and I had an office at the church building, which is actually in the mission here where I'm sharing this message. And uh, that office was on the second floor behind the balcony. And it was, uh, it was the pre cell phone era that, that, I mean, I think there were people who had, in fact, I'm pretty sure there were, there were people who had mobile phones, but this is the only way I know how to describe it. If you see a picture of them, you look it up. They were actually more like walkie talkies <laughs> that you would see in World War II. I mean, the cell phones that they had were, you know, just huge mega pieces of machinery. And, uh, you know, they were cumbersome and, and only, only those who were kind of wealthy or on the cutting edge had the walkie talkie phone that with no cord. And that was quite a breakthrough. But anyway, I know for, for, some of you, it's, it's hard to imagine being disconnected. I get that. Honestly, I'm so used to having a phone or a device on me that it's, it's hard to imagine not having the speed of access, but there was a time I can assure you there was a time when we did not have smartphones and, and that time had its pros and it had its cons. I mean, there's a, there's a, 
a danger. I think we're all aware of this and always being connected. And it's, it's a little, it's a little addictive. And I, I do think that one of the downsides of, of the iPhone era, this, this era of mobility and connectedness and connectivity and just exceptional technological advancement is that it does set us up for an unhealthy and, and toxic life pace. It really does where we're just always on and it requires discipline. I think you know that and intentional restraint and disconnect. And that's a whole lot easier said than done in the older days. It felt harder to get information quickly, but it, and it, because it was, <laughs> I mean, for me, I couldn't just Google up a, a question to double check something. I, um, even as a pastor, I would have to go back and spend a lot of time researching, uh, through books and encyclopedias. And it was just a, a laborious process that was just an assumed part of, of life for generations before us that we now, uh, really just can't really even comprehend because we, we know that in a matter of, of, of seconds, we can get most of the information we need. And when we don't get it, we actually kind of get frustrated or, you know, upset. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting how times have changed, but I wonder if, uh, in an era such as this, where a lot of our time gets sucked up in distractions and, and, you know, even some things that are just not even helpful. They're just neither good or bad. They're just kind of mind numbing or distracting. And, but there are other things that are unhealthy, really unhealthy that we can wander into as well. And they hurt and they damage us. So, you know, um, I just wonder if, if maybe if Sabbath and intentional disconnection may be even more, yeah, even more important because there are so many voices vying for our attention. And I wonder if, um, we might not be more, we, we might have more duress than we realize because we're under a ton of nonstop digital and informational uh, movement. And it's just like, it's just, we're constantly being bombarded. Anyway, pastor, you're wandering. That's why I hear somebody telling me, <laughs> I know, but it's good. I, I guess in a way, but remember not all who wander are lost. So bear with me. But anyway, back to my story. I got to remember back to my story because it's connected to what happened with Judah, at least in a, in a way, but it was about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And I had been out of the office for a couple of hours when I came back there, uh, I noted that there was a message handwritten taped to my door and no one could contact me. I didn't have a phone. I remember this was the pre-phone era. And on that note, it said, call Kaiser, uh, Caleb. That was our oldest son who was about 14 months at the time. He was just a little guy. You know, Cheryl was actually pregnant with Chloe who just had our granddaughter, Kyla, who's her name is Chloe Cahill <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it, well, Kaiser had, um, yeah, I still remember it, get a little emotional remembering it, but Kaiser had, had Caleb in, in intensive care. He had just been rushed to the emergency. And, and when I, when I called, they told me it was very serious. And, um, they wouldn't go into the details, but they said I needed to get there right away. And evidently it was some type of a serious seizure that he had. And I remember, I just remember this vividly, uh, leaving the church, driving, uh, up 17th street, crossing over market, going over to Divisadero, going down, praying, praying, really praying with fear, with fear. Yes. And questions racing through my mind about, uh, my son, because. I was just one, I wasn't sure. Does this mean he's gonna, gonna die? Does this mean he'll have, you know, permanent brain impairment and he's so little. And I just, I, all those things were racing through my minds and I was trying to 
trust God and, and praying for his deliverance. And I'll never forget walking into the unit and seeing my uh, little guy, the little fellow, uh, seemingly unconscious, uh, splayed out on the table. And there were, you know, Cheryl was there, but there were six, six to seven people working on him and, and, and tubes were everywhere. And there was an oxygen mask on his face. And I, I felt so helpless. I was worried. Um, even though I had steadied myself in prayer, uh, I was frightened. Like I said, that, that he would suffer, uh, real brain damage or die. And, um, you know, he ended up, the good news is he ended up being okay. And, and though it wasn't a hundred percent certain what had caused him to have the seizure, we were pretty sure it was connected to uh, the chemicals and fumes near the floor of a printer shop where, where we had, had brought him with us. And anyway, he ended up <laughs> recovering completely. And now he is a fine young man in his thirties, uh, early thirties, bright, intelligent, a follower of Jesus, um, part of our church community. And I'm very proud of him works here in the, in the city. But I look back on that moment at a, as a time when Cheryl and I, and you know, I don't think about it enough. I don't say thank you enough to the Lord. I, at the time I did, but I think as the years have gone by, I've, I've forgotten. In fact, it's something like this that brings it back to my mind again, but I think we were spared the impact of tragedy. And I hope you understand loved ones, how that would have changed the course of our family in this church forever. You know, as a pastor, I have over the years worked with people where that has not been the case. And I have found that grace is needed at those times more than ever. And this brings us back to Judah for his growth and transformation is I think I really do. The reason this is the connection. I think it's one of the underappreciated subplots in the account of Joseph's life story. The emergence of Judah as a sensitive, sacrificial man is striking and unexpected. And I actually think it's connected in part to the pain that he walked through in that 20 year period, in that gap, at least of in that gap of life where he lost his um, two oldest sons. Remember, it was uh, Judah who convinced a stubborn and fearful Jacob to finally let Benjamin go. Remember in, in Genesis uh, 43, his passionate and heartfelt plea, just put it up there real quick. He said, Judah said to his father, send the boy with me and we will be on our way. Otherwise we will all die of starvation. And not only we, but you and our little ones, I personally guarantee his safety. You may hold me responsible if I don't bring him back to you. And then, then let me bear the blame forever father. And if you recall, so that's Judah being sacrificial. And if you recall, it was Judah who also pleaded with Joseph when Benjamin was caught with the apparent stolen goods and was about to be taken captive as a slave, saying essentially, uh, Judah appeals. He did what the other brothers did not do. He appeals. He says, let me take his place. He's so young. He's so young. Reminds me of Le Miserable, right? You're so young. And it's going to tear my aged father apart. He won't be able to bear it. I will give up my freedom. I will give up my life for his Judah says. And in that sense, he was foreshadowing his greatest descendant descendant who will do, uh, for all of us, um, what Judah offered to do, but that, that of course is Jesus. And that's another story, right? A greater story of sacrifice. And remember in that moment, Joseph was overwhelmed. It was unexpected. And in Joseph's mind, he's thinking, is this the same man, Judah, the one who was so callous, so clever and shrewd that he came up with the idea to have me sold as a slave? Yeah, it was the same one. Now it appears, and this is the, this is what I want us to, to hear. It appears that time and loss had reworked his soul, made him a different man. Judas stands out as the most changed of them all, of all the brothers. He's the most changed. And I just have to wonder 
if part of that change had to do with the, the loss that, that impacted his life, that, that he was deeply affected, um, and that, 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 that tragedy became a catalyst for positive change. I mean, suffering and loss, loved ones, tend to do one of two things to us, don't they? They either soften us or they ruin us. Suffering a loss tends to make people more loving and kind and sensitive and sympathetic. This is what I've noticed after now years of pastoring and observing um, people. Or it tends to make people more embittered and callous and indifferent to the pain of others in its worst form. It, it kind of creates a kind of coldness and insensitivity. And here's the thing. When we allow God into the places of loss, not only will he heal us, but I believe he will help grow us into a deeper, more, um, well, I don't know, just a, a better soul, a better person. He will rework our soul. That's what I'm saying. And I love that phrase. I love the idea of God reworking our soul. It's one of the things he does and, um, no one else can do it the way the Lord can. When we surrender to him, he can rework our soul. When we surrender our pain to him, he can redeem it. He, when we surrender our lost years, he can, he can return them in a different way. You see what God does. You see what happens when we allow him to, do we see his goodness on full display? You know, one thing is clear. Judah had learned to trust, you know, God, but he had also earned the trust of his father. And we're given an interesting detail. Just want to throw this in there as they approached Egypt. Look what it says in Genesis 46 verse 28. This is from the NLT. It says, as they neared their destination, Jacob sent Judah, Judah ahead to meet Joseph and get directions to the region of Goshen. There was a trust that Jacob had in Judah. Judah becomes the point person. And, and his story reminds me of a few things. Three of them, I'm just going to just really quickly allude to, um, and share before we break for, uh, our song. And, uh, but there's a fourth one that I'm going to share on the backside of the special, uh, that we're going to enjoy together. But Judah's story reminds us of a few things that we can do when life gets hard, when the rain comes and it will, it may not come the way that it came into Judah's life, but rain will come. And when it does, you know, um, there's some things that it would be helpful for us to remember. The first two actually have to do with relational disappointment and the last two have to do with pain. But remember this because Judah is a model of this. Remember, that, and here it is. Number one, people can change and people can grow. And that's obviously true of those who follow, you know, follow Jesus, you know, and it could be true of people who don't follow him. I, I acknowledge that, but the likelihood of growth is enhanced dramatically when Christ is welcomed in because at its core, the Christian life is when it's, when it's genuinely engaged and when real commitment is made, right? It's not so much true if it's just done as a passive kind of a religious filler that we live at a passive surface level. No, but when it's really something that is a, a deeply embedded part of our life, uh, we will find that it becomes a life of continual grace and breakthrough and growth to the, honestly, to the day we die. Like we, and we can flourish even in our older years. I've seen this. I've watched it happen. So remember this people can change. People can grow. Judah had changed. He had grown. He had learned. He was a different man that can happen for all of us. We can get better. We don't have to get bitter. We can get better. And the second thing, let's be careful about putting people, especially people we are close to. And I say this a lot. You hear me say it into boxes, always viewing them through the same lens in a way 
in a certain way, we can lock people up and never let them out. We just put them in and, and they've disappointed us so much that we will always see them through the lens of that disappointment. And by God's grace, I appeal to you that we need to leave room for change. We need to leave room for grace. We need to leave room for God to move in a life. He can, he does, he will. It's a pattern of the Lord. It's his way of blessing. And we need to pray for better days. We need to pray and celebrate small improvements. Sometimes we fixate on the disappointments and we, we don't celebrate enough the improvements, even though they're just small that people are making, you know, sometimes people start with a real, you know, they're, they're, they've, they've gotten themselves into a place where they're so deep, deeply depressed into, um, a low place that even for them, a little progress sometimes doesn't look like much, but for them, it might actually be a big step. And we need to really thank the Lord for that and encourage and applaud that. And, and I'm not talking about just saying happy things to say them, but we, if we can focus on things that we can encourage that are good, we will find that there is a, a greater likelihood that that will happen again. Right. And then the third thing, this one shifts a little bit, but it has to do with what I think happened in Judah's life and something that I found to be true, that profound progress is often connected to profound pain. And I think, like I said, that's part of Judah's transformation. When we submit our loss to Jesus, we should not be surprised when leaps of growth and layers of healing occur. I mean, I'm talking about the breakdown that leads to the breakthrough that leads to the breakout. Remember, I always talk about that to such a degree that we become wounded healers in his name. And that's what we're reminded of in second Corinthians one, right? Three and four, that all praise to God, the father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. God is our merciful father and source of all comfort. How thankful we are for that. But then look what it says in verse four. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Do you see what that's saying? We have been healed to heal. We are being healed to help and heal others. It's the way of Jesus. And when it works right, um, there's nothing like it in the world. So, you know, I do want to, Remind all of you, it's the time I get to do it to our online community. If you're new here, don't feel any pressure around it. Really, I don't want you to, but I do want to remind everybody about our giving time. It's how our church keeps doing what we're doing. And it's about being faithful to God and our tithes and our offerings and honoring him with our first fruits. And remember, you can give in a number of different ways as so many of you have been doing so beautifully. You can give by sending it into our offices. You can give online through our website. You can go and do what I do, which gives through the app. But uh, I always say, you know, make sure we give him our heart. And I think the two are more connected than we realize but we've got a great song that we're going to share and it's called when the rain comes. It's about what happens when we get hit with things and, and, um, it could be disappointment with ourselves, disappointment with others, or just the, the tough spots in life that are even sometimes a little bit tragic in terms of loss. Keep that in mind. As we share this song, I'm going to come back. I mentioned there was four things. I have one more to share. So here we go. <laughs> Fall on 
One of the things that the song reminded us of was that in addition to God's unshakable love, um, we also have been given the gifts of, of other people in our lives and the blessing of being there for one another. Do you see that? The blessing of being there for one another. And can you hear me when I say this? And this is the fourth thing that I mentioned that part of the way God redeems the pains and the shames of our past, thinking about Judah, is by making us more compassionate and tender, and more empathetic and sensitive to others who are hurting. I mentioned how, you know, Judah had some dark moments in his life. I mean, the initiator of having Joseph sold into slavery, the guilt that he bore there, and yet, over time, God had reworked his soul and the Lord's goodness was there in this hard place and brought about healing and life. And I think it's, it's something that when we've been touched with God's goodness, we are then invited to become wounded healers. I think we understand that. Wounded healers in his name, being there, be, being available in our imperfections to minister life in a good word an arm on a shoulder, a listening ear, a word of prayer, a text of encouragement that we send because God put it in our heart to do so. Expressions, I call them the expressions of kingdom love. Lord, help us to do this. Help us to do this. You are so good. You've been so good to us. You are so good. You are so good. You are so good. And you are so God and you call us to so good, and you call us to so God. So don't forget, Lord, I want you to know it, how loved you are. He's the healer. He's the one who redeems the lost years. Yeah, and may he keep you, and me too. <laughs> I pray for it in every way, in your spirit, in your soul, in your body, and in your mind, in Jesus' name. Hi everyone! For those of you who might not know me, I'm Serena and this is Carter. We have just a couple of things to mention before we go. This week we have our virtual art class for kids. So you, if you have elementary or middle schoolers who love to draw, have them join us online this Wednesday afternoon. And if you're new to our community, we will also be having an online meet and greet on Wednesday at 6 p.m. If you're interested, we would love to meet you and get to know you. All right, that's all for this week. Have a great week. Bye. Thank you.
But hiding such a lonely thing to do I can't stop the rain from falling down on you again I can't stop the rain but I will hold you till it goes When the rain comes 